Hey, what's up? It is your Wednesday edition of Locked On Raptors coming to you a little bit later than normal, but that's because there was a game to talk about and also there was some scheduling snafus, but that's okay because we have a very fun and weird and kind of stupid Raptors loss to talk about here. 110-109 loss to the Oklahoma City Thunder at home that came down to the fingertips of undrafted free agent Justin Champagne just to give you a bit of a clue as to how weird this game was. We will talk about what went wrong for the Raptors in the third quarter in particular, what went right as they brought it back and almost pulled out a miracle comeback, and we will hand out the dude of the game. Have I already said the dude of the game's name so far in the cold open? You will have to find out by listening to today's episode of Locked on Raptors. Thanks for being here. You are Locked on Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1074, I think, of Locked On Raptors for Wednesday, December the 8th. I'm your host, Sean Woodley of RaptorsHQ.com. You can find me on Twitter, as always, at Woodley Sean. You can find the show at Locked On Raptors, where you can find links to every single episode of the podcast. And of course, please make sure to check out the podcast on all your favorite podcast apps, free and available wherever you listen to podcasts in audio form. Please follow, subscribe, rate, review, all the good stuff you can do on those apps. And also, a reminder, you can find us on YouTube for the low, low price of on the house. Just hit subscribe and all of a sudden you get to see my face every day. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, also, thank you so much for making us your first listen of the day. And let's get to it, shall we? On today's show, we are talking about the Toronto Raptors lost to the OKC Thunder on Wednesday, a 110-109 loss that came down to a missed tap-in, actually a made tap-in on a sort of flailing missed floater block shot type thing from Fred Van Vliet late in the going here from Justin Champagne, almost tapping it in for the win, but it unfortunately left his finger just a second too late. We will dig into all of the weirdness that led up to that final moment of the game where things went wrong for the Raptors, what they did well, some things to build on. And I think there are a lot of things to build on here because the guys who were good for the Raptors are the players who matter the most, which has kind of been the story all season long. We'll get to that. Plus, we have our due to the game to hand out, as we always do. But before we get into any of that, I should tell you about one of our sponsors for today. And that is Truebill, who are bringing you today's podcast. We love Truebill. I love Truebill because they are the app that saves you money by helping you identify it and stop paying for the subscriptions that you no longer want or need. You can even negotiate better deals on those you want to keep as well with Truebill. Thanks to them for sponsoring the podcast. All right, let's get to it. Again, 110-109, Raptors fall to 11-14. and 14. The dream of a 5-0 and finish to the homestand dashed by the OKC Thunder and in large part, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, who took over this game in the second half. But we should dig into where things went wrong for the Raptors. This seemed like a game where the Raptors were going to go into cruise control. The Thunder are not very good. We know this. They just snapped an eight-game losing streak a couple days ago. They lost by 73 points six days ago to a Ja Morantless Memphis Grizzlies team. This is not a good basketball team. And so losing to them certainly stings a little bit. It felt like they were going to win, though, the Raptors. They were up 10 after the first quarter. I think they shot 59% in the first half. They seemed like they were just kind of in cruise control. But the cruise control... It got a little bit like, I don't know, you know when you're driving sometimes, you have cruise control on, you're going up a hill, and you kind of feels like your car is going to die uh, because it's working so hard to cruise control itself up the hill. It's kind of what happened here for the Raptors in the third quarter. In particular, the bench unit was a nightmare for the Raptors. And look, it's not all bench guys. There were starters with bench guys throughout. Uh, Scotty Barnes and Fred Van Vliet, namely, were the guys with that bench crew for a big chunk of that third quarter and the Raptors after a very promising highly offensive first half score 12 points to the Thunders 33 in that third quarter and it just was not there for any of the bench guys in this game Delano Banton did really not a whole lot of anything was 0 of 3 from the field missed a couple of gorgeous wide open threes created by delicious Scotty Barnes cross court passes that he just could not knock down Isak Bonga played 14 minutes in this game. He got a lot of run. Of course, Precious Achua 
Ken Birch, OG Ananobi not available for this game. So there was no actual center for the Raptors in this one. Chris Boucher got the nod to start at center. We'll get to him as well. But Bonga, I thought, was probably the most damaging player for the Raptors in this game, especially in that third quarter. He got absolutely cooked by Shea Gildas Alexander time after time in that third. Could not stay in front of him whatsoever. Was fouling him pretty liberally as well. He had three personal fouls in just 14 minutes. And on offense, he, you know, got to the he hit one three. He got to the rim after a, you know an attempted dunk and you know got to the line for a couple free throws. But that was about it from Bonga. Was a minus nine a team worst minus nine in this game that's or actually no Delano Bennett was a minus 11 uh, but both of those guys unsurprisingly leading the Raptors in minuses in this one they were just really ineffectual as was Sfi Mihailuk who is really I think teetering on being in the rotation at all once this team is at full health you know he just is not providing a whole lot and Yuta Watanabe who was also not very good in this game but did have three assists and have some moments where he looked quite good I thought maybe deserved a little bit more run in the in the end of this game in the fourth quarter, which we'll get to. But I thought, you know, with the way Utah's been playing, there's kind of that pressure that's been building a little bit for Sfi here uh, kind of over the last week or two here. And I think this is kind of the game that might have broken the camel's back when it comes to Sfi Mihailuk rotation player he was really rough seven minutes was 0 for 3 0 for 2 from uh from downtown and just had, had three turnovers was really miserable got subbed out really quick during the third quarter gary trent jr comes in and uh you could kind of see nick nurse giving Svi a little talking to on the sidelines that to me you know feels like the sort of welcome invite to the doghouse and so you know again they're not fully healthy og still out of the lineup and obviously most of their injuries are in the front court right now but with the way Fred Van Vliet's playing crazy minutes, the way Scotty Barnes and Utah are kind of like positionally ambiguous, who knows what they are? Are they wings? Are they guards? Are they centers? Who the hell knows? And with the way Delano Banton still gets run, which maybe isn't going to last for that long, I'm not sure, I, I think you're really seeing the limits of Sweet Mihailuk right now. And that sucks because I thought Mihailuk was going to be a really useful piece for this team. But, you know, where, where I would have had him penciled in as like the eighth man in a fully healthy Raptors rotation, I think he's now like no better than 10th or 11th. And that is not going to cut it in terms of getting into the lineup. Um, you know, the fourth quarter comes around after the bench kind of pisses it away in the third quarter. And it was a Pascal Siakam and Scotty Barnes led bench crew to start that uh, fourth quarter as well. And it was equally rough to start the fourth quarter. It wasn't really until around the six minute mark that things kind of coalesced and they went on that heater, which we'll talk about in just a second. But I also want to talk about the lack of Precious Achua in this game and how that hurt the defense. I really didn't think the defense was going to matter all that much against this Thunder team that can't score points. They really are a moribund offense. They are not a good three-point shooting team, but lo and behold, your Toronto Raptors breaking the bad shooting spell of a bad team. Uh, it's kind of like their thing these days, I suppose, has been their thing for the last couple seasons now. The Thunder uh, currently sit at the second worst offense in the league, were the worst offense in the league coming into this one. They're not very good, and I didn't think the pressures that you a loss was going to matter that much. But before the game, Nick Nurse talked about the lack of Achua, the lack of Birch, and why that was going to be a challenge for them. And it's because of the chemistry. We've talked so much in recent days about how the chemistry is coalescing and how it's coming together, how things are looking a little bit more like they should. And the Raptors are playing defense the way Nick Nurse wants them to play it and doing so effectively. When you take the center out, as Nick Nurse said, he's like, we don't change the system because the center is out. Maybe you should think about changing the system. I'm not sure. It's hard to say. You know, you, I guess there's two schools of thought there is you play the same way all the time and you're going to school yourself in it and be comfortable. And that's how you gain chemistry and gain momentum and how to play it and have stretches like they've had in the last few games here. But when you don't have someone who can be that backstop in a defensive system that so desperately needs that sound defensive anchor, maybe you should think about maybe playing a little bit more of a conservative scheme. That said, they did not do that. They were kind of flying around all over the place, doing their aggressive thing as they tend to do, getting their bigs switched out, their bigs switched out onto, uh, for those listening on audio only, that was uh, dick finger quotes that I just did around bigs. Um, you know, they, they stuck with their defense. And without Precious Achua in there, who has been as incredible defensively as he has been rocky offensively lately, that really did them in in that third quarter as well. You know, it wasn't too much of a concern in the first half. You know, you, you give up 54 points. It's not like you're, you know, upset about giving up 54 points in the first half. I didn't think it was a terribly poor defensive performance. It kind of felt honestly like, all right, we don't have to try that hard. It's the Thunder. And of course, they got burned by that very much in the third quarter. And that lack of Precious Achua really came through. Like, I bet if Precious Achua is available in this game, 
they probably win it. And, and it got to the point in the fourth quarter where Nick Nurse didn't trust anybody else to play that center position. And Justin Champagny got in there for some run. It was really the only effective guy off the bench for the Raptors in this game. So we will get into what went well to lead to that crazy finish in the fourth quarter coming up in just a sec. Uh, you know, as far as other things that went wrong, I don't really know if there's that much else. It was a really, really rough defensive game. The lack of chemistry, not being in the right spots. Shea Gildas Alexander just given the Raptors fits because he's amazing. He finished this game with a very tidy 26 points. Got to the line 12, 12 times as well. Just a really, really good game for really, really good player. And Lou Dort, of course, was doing Lord, Lou Dort things. But most of all, I think this was really hung on the bench guys who did not contribute much on Chris Boucher, who had a really nice start to this game, but kind of fizzled in the third quarter as the game went along and did not get put in, back into the game in the fourth quarter for crunch time. And you end up with the result that you end up with. But that said... The result could have been a lot uglier had things not gotten really exciting and fun down the stretch of this game. So we will dive into the reasons for said fun and excitement in just one second. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Calm. Look, you might be feeling a little bit stressed out watching that stressful Raptors game and you are not going to be able to fall asleep because you're buzzing, baby. Well, guess what? Uh, the Calm is here to help you with your sleep and your mental fitness, not just after you're watching tough basketball games, but just because generally life is difficult and is going to make it difficult for you to sleep sometimes. When it comes to athletes, we tend to focus on physical fitness, but there's another side to the game that's just as important. That is mental fitness and Calm is the number one app for sleep and meditation and they have teamed up with LeBron James to help you train your mind and become the champion version of yourself. Calm can help you train your brain so you sleep better, reduce your stress, and perform at your best just like King James. For LeBron, sleep is a critical part of his mental fitness routine. He's not in year 18 of the end of his NBA career doing crazy LeBron things, even though the Lakers are sad. He's still LeBron, and there's a reason for it. It's because he sleeps really well. That is job number one for your brain is getting that rest so it can be at full 100% capacity. So if you head to calm.com slash locked in NBA, and for a limited time, you're going to get a 40% off of a Calm, uh, sorry, you get 40% off a Calm premium subscription. With Calm, you have access to nature scenes that LeBron loves, like rain on leaves, which sounds delightful to fall asleep to. And you get so much more, like sleep stories uh, and meditation, so you can be ready for any challenges that life throws your way. And I got to say, my fiance uses Calm, and she swears by it as well. She loves it. And I, if LeBron loves it and my fiance loves it, that's enough for me. Go to calm.com right now slash locked on NBA and get a 40% discount on a calm premium subscription. Again, that's C A L M.com slash locked on NBA. Unlock content to help you focus, ease stress, and sleep better. Get started at calm.com slash locked on NBA. That is C A L M.com slash locked on NBA. And today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Built Bar, who are making the best tasting protein bars money can buy. You get the best of both worlds with Built Bar. You get healthy and tasty. Those are the two things you want in all foods, baby. You get a million flavors to choose from as well. Not quite a million, but lots of flavors available. You got the regular staples like raspberry or mint brownie. Plus, you get the odd limited time flavor. Rumor has it right now, someone in our DM chat at Locked On was mentioning that there is a caramel macchiato flavor available over at BuiltBar.com right now. Go pick that up immediately because that sounds amazing. And if you don't pick it up, I'm going to pick it up. And look, we all have our favorite flavors, but you have you don't know. You're not going to know your favorite flavor until you find it and try it for yourself. Maybe you want to tell Santa to throw a couple built bars in your stocking as well. That's a fun little stocking stuffer. Also, as someone who's very bad at wrapping presents, I love just throwing something that in that's already wrapped. It's got the wrapper on it. I don't have to put any wrapping paper on it and embarrass myself. And you want to cozy up with something warm. Here's a little holiday tip for you. Dip your built bar into a piping hot cup of cocoa. You're going to soften that up a little bit, make it nice and tasty. And it's a nice, delicious treat you don't have to feel so bad about. Like some of those marshmallow. Do you like some of those marshmallowy treats around the holidays as well? I was reading that copy in a strange inflection. Either way, if you like marshmallowy treats, you need to get your hands on built bar puffs. They're light, fluffy, marshmallowy through and through, different flavors, all covered in chocolate. Tastes so good, you won't believe that they're filled with protein. Go to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off of your order that's built.com with the promo code locked 15 for 15 percent off all right let's get into what went well 
for the Raptors in this game. Before I do that, though, I should tease. There's a reason that the schedule for today's podcast was out of whack. Usually we record in the morning, of course. Uh, but I was supposed to record in the morning with a special guest. That got bumped to the afternoon. That guest is now going to be tomorrow uh, You know, to maintain uh, freshness for the podcast. And that guest is Kayla Gray from TSN. I'm very excited about it. It's already recorded. I'm wearing the clothes you see right now uh, if you're watching the video. Uh, so please don't uh, you know judge me for not changing my clothes. It's all recorded in the same day. But Kayla Gray is on tomorrow's podcast. Take a look for that probably around the early afternoon time. Either way. Let's dive in to what went well for the Raptors as they brought this game back. And, you know, we got to go to the start of the game as well to kind of inform what went well late as well. And Pascal Siakam had his fingerprints all over this game. He finishes with 23 points in this one, 11 boards, 5 assists, uh, and was a plus 8. 10 of 15 shooting, hit both of his threes, only got to the line three times and hit one of them. But overall, a really excellent Pascal Siakam game. He was just lights out in the first half, had 16 on 7 of 9 shooting, was hitting everything from everywhere. The mid-range game for him, I talked about it a couple days ago about how he's at a career high uh, percentage of his shots coming from 16 feet to the three-point line, and also a by far a career high there as well from about 46% from that range. That's going to go up after tonight as well. Not updated on basketball reference yet for me to check, but absolutely going to go up considering he shot 67% in the game. And a lot of his shots came from that mid-range area. He was really good and then in in the second half the third quarter things kind of slowed down for a little bit because the thunder did the thing where you know teams load up three guys or four guys to throw at siakam when he drives into the paint he's so clearly the most dynamic offensive player for this team he's a load to handle on straight line drives you need that extra help and because the guys around him were not hitting their shots in this game the thunder were getting away from getting away with it even fred van vliet had a rough game until later in this one when he started banging everything in but he had a pretty rough game uh, you had, of course, you know, Chris Boucher was 0 of 2 from 3. The bench guys did not hit their threes whatsoever. It was a really rough scene. And Siakam was just getting harangued with extra limbs and bodies in that third quarter. He made some really good adjustments, though, going into the fourth. And I thought the reason the Raptors were able to figure themselves out and go on that run, I think it was like a 26 to 10 run before the Mike Muscala 3 put them away to close the game. The reason they went on that run in the last five and a half minutes or so was Pascal really got into the teeth of the defense and was making great reads out of the thicket of arms that he was swarmed by every time he got within 10 feet of the basket. He hit Fred for a couple of threes that way. I want to say he hit Gary Trent for a three like that as well. And it just kind of opened things up when he was able to make those plays and get downhill. And we've seen that from Siakam. He's had plenty of practice (laughs) passing through extra defensive attention over the last couple of seasons. Uh, and it's been nice to see him really kind of take that on and not force it anymore. Again, this kind of goes back to, you know, learning in the bubble and the, the series against the Celtics when he was doing the same thing, driving into Marcus Smart, Jalen Brown, Al Horford. Was he still on that team? Maybe not. Uh, but driving into a collection of dudes at all times and not really having the space to operate or score, but still going up with it anyway and not finding any good results. He's clearly learned from that experience, and this is sort of the long game benefit of that, is that he's just gotten really good at playmaking when there's extra attention thrown his way. I also thought Scotty Barnes was really essential to how things closed out in this one too. You know, he had a great first half. His first like six minutes, he had six two and th- or six three and two with a block and a steal, and was just kind of everywhere. A uh, bit of a slow middle portion of the game. You know, he had a couple of moments here where it looked like he might take over, hit a three in the third quarter when things were really kind of scuffling for the Raptors, and it seemed like oh, here comes the Scotty Barnes takeover stretch, and then it didn't, never really quite came. Couldn't quite get that sort of you know those gears rolling and into motion. But in the fourth quarter, they used him as a short roller a few times. We've talked plenty of times about why I think Scotty Barnes as a short roller is going to be such a useful piece for this team and also why I think him and Pascal Siakam are such an interesting fit with one another because both can do that and make plays from the middle of the floor. There's a lot of diversity to your attack if you can run those guys in pick and roll with Fred Van Vliet and have either one of them operating from those middle areas. And Scotty Barnes found Justin Champagne on a cut in one instance. He found, I think, Pascal for his fourth quarter three as well from the short roll range in the middle of the floor. He's just such a good playmaker when he's got that space. And the Thunder were selling out to stop Fred Van Vliet in this game pretty hard. Lou Dort did a really good job guarding him. It kind of fell on those guys in that next sort of phase of the offense after it got out of Fred's hands. And I thought Barnes did a wonderful job there, and I want to see more of it. And it's why I kind of like him as a small ball center 
and why it kind of worked late in this game. You know, Justin Champagne, I guess, was the defensive center for the team in this one down the stretch. But offensively, Barnes was really sort of the, the guy who was stirring the drink as the center, setting those screens, getting to the middle of the floor and then making reads from there. Uh, give me more of that. He's really fun. 18, 8 and 5 for Scotty Barnes in this one was a sort of a stealth due to the game candidate until late in this one. But he is not going to take it home today. It will be a first time winner today, which we will get to very shortly. Um, you know, obviously, Fred Van Vliet did some crazy things in this one, hit some big time you know melons threes that he's kind of become accustomed to hitting um you know he was not awesome so you know for the first three and a half quarters of this game he looked a little bit slow didn't quite have the burst he at one point looked like he was kind of hobbled for a second the broadcast made note of it he was slow getting back up the floor not sure if that had anything to do with the way he kind of just lacked that zip tonight but the fourth quarter comes around and he just kind of realized, oh, now is the time to hit all these threes. And he did very much hit all these threes in that time. He also finished with eight boards and nine assists. Uh, so a very tidy 19, eight and nine for Fred, despite a pretty rough shooting night, just six of 20 was really rough from two point range. And honestly, didn't love the decision to go to him late in this game with the last possession. It's kind of a clunky last possession for the Raptors honestly you know it got, it got real fun with the tap in from Champagne but there was sort of a slow inbound Siakam caught it kind of contested just like whipped it back to Fred kind of an awkward fashion there was already a couple seconds taken off the clock at that point and Fred had to iso against Shea Gildas Alexander which is not really what you want even though Shea Gildas Alexander is not an amazing defender he's much longer and just kind of in the way of Fred and made a really nice play forcing a sort of blocked floater like I don't know Michael Ruffin looking shot from Fred Van Vliet of course it ends up off the fingers of Champagne and in it's too late all that but you know I thought you know outside of that last possession in the first three and a half quarters the sort of six minutes of excellent Fred Van Vliet basketball here were kind of everything you want from Fred Van Vliet and I thought it was a really nice thing to see him have a game where you know it didn't look very good for him for a while and he was able to kind of salvage his night just by being you know very extremely clutch and kind of knowing exactly what the team needed uh also Gary Trent Jr. again kind of the running theme of this season whenever there's a loss good or bad it tends to be that the starters were just fine and the bench guys kind of let the rest of the team down. And Gary Trent Jr. was excellent in this game. It was nice to see him kind of get back on track after a couple slow games since coming back from injury. 24 points, four boards, uh, four, three assists, two steals, 10 to 17 overall, led the team in scoring. And didn't do it in like a sort of, all right, now it's my heat check type of way. He did it in a pretty controlled and reserved way the kind of way that you want Gary Trent to be operating when he is the fourth or fifth, shot, fifth option on the floor, which is what he's going to be when this team is at full health. This was a really good example of what Gary Trent Jr. can be as a role player, as an outlet for the Raptors, more sort of defensive attention garnering type guys. This was an excellent, you know, fifth option, fourth option type game from Gary Trent Jr. And when he's going off like that, in theory, you should probably win games Sadly, they did not because of weirdness, a good game from the Thunder, and of course, the bench not super hot in this one. The defense, we talked about all the reasons why this did not go terribly well for your Toronto Raptors. But again, I think, you know, the things that matter, the guys that matter, Barnes, Van Vliet, Trent, Siakam, they were the ones that really kind of carried the day in this one for the Raptors. Credit to them for doing that, but they just needed more help, man. And, and like, I cannot express how ready I am to see those four guys plus Birch and Anobi and Achua and then you throw in Utah and you know X number nine guy or 10 guy and I think you're cooking with something here it's just hard to see the full vision because we literally haven't seen the full vision yet except for maybe one game and that is a huge supreme bummer with that, though, we'll leave off the what went well section of the podcast and move into the dude of the game with another guy who did some good stuff. He's really the only guy we haven't talked about yet outside of the mentions of the tip in. Yes, we're talking about Justin Champagne coming up in the dude of the game segment. But first, I want to tell you about our pals over at betonline.ag. They have you covered all season for more props, odds, and lines than ever before. As football season continues to march towards the playoffs, BetOnline remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code LOCKEDON to receive that bonus. From basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait and take advantage of all the amazing offers for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online is where the game starts. All right, let's get to it. Your dude of the game for the very first time 
is Justin Champagny, baby. He was a delight in the late going in this game. He played, I believe, the entire fourth quarter. Is that right? Yeah, 12 minutes, didn't check in until the fourth quarter, and was, you know, a little rough for the first section of the fourth quarter when they were still kind of scuffling. His offense was very much not, um, you know, it was not very much there. Sorry, I'm just doing the graphic for the due to the game because production is very much my strength. Uh, but... <laughs> um, yeah, I, I thought Champagne, you know, a little bit rough to start, but then very clearly kind of settled in as the game went along. And he sort of, you know, he, he realized, OK, I'm out here to play defense and I'm out here to rebound and kind of get those dirty buckets underneath. And he did that. I, I thought the way that Champagne sort of, you know, was that sort of steady defensive presence for stretches of this game for the Raptors. It's what they desperately needed and what they were missing in Precious Achua. He's not as good as Precious Achua. There were still a couple of possessions where SGA completely cooked him as he felt like he cooked everybody on the Raptors once or twice at some point tonight because he's that good. But I thought Champagne settled in nicely. And as Nick Nurse said, he didn't trust any of the other guys out there, didn't like any of the other guys out there in that spot. I'm not surprised Boucher didn't get the call late in this one. As much as he had a nice offensive game, a good start to the game, his defense remains uh, not awesome. And he just is not in position where you need him. He's not a five. He can't play the five, really. He's at a position at all times, and he's much better put to use as like a roving four who can go block shots. And he did block a three in this game, so credit to Boucher for that. But I didn't hate the decision to just try it out with Champagne. He had a couple nice plays. He had a, you know, the, the, the finish from Scotty Barnes when he was cutting. He had a beautiful bucket to tie it up at, I think, 107 or 10. It might it take, it was, take a lead with, at 109, 107. That's what it was. He took the lead. He was stood as the game winning bucket until Mike Muscala came in. Yes, this was a dueling Justin Champagne, Mike Muscala finish, just the way you drew it up. But I thought, you know, just his sort of wherewithal getting to the basket and putting in that, that bucket. Sort of through a scramble, if I recall, it was sort of a chaotic possession and he ends up putting it in to go ahead. Like that's just, you know, good stuff, good garbage man stuff from Justin Champagne and doing garbage man stuff is a one way path to winning yourself a due to the game uh, nod it, crowned trophy. Is it a ribbon? We haven't decided yet what the hardware is, but either way, um, you know, and, and then you get that final possession and I feel really badly for Justin Champagne. There literally might be another chance, not be another chance in his NBA career where he is getting that opportunity to put in a winning shot. It was a weird sort of confluence of circumstances. I don't think that this game is going to necessarily put Justin Champagne into real rotation duty anytime soon. We don't know. Like this could be the most high leverage time Justin Champagne ever plays with the Raptors. He's an undrafted guy playing center in a pinch in a weird game against a weird team that's kind of bad that's playing over its head. And Justin Champagne's in there finding himself in like this crazy back and forth finish. It was really cool to watch. Happy for him. But like, I feel terrible for him that this might be his one chance at an NBA game winner. And it just fluttered away out of his fingertips because the clock decided to go a little bit early. Um, you know, just a, a disappointing finish to what was a pretty fun game. And I will say this. I, you know, you don't want to lose to the Thunder. The Thunder stink. They're an embarrassing franchise. And any team that makes the Thunder look like anything but an embarrassment should be a little disappointed with themselves because the Thunder stink. And they're trying to stink. They're going out of their way to be bad. They're playing Mike Muscala in the last few minutes of an insanely close back and forth affair and giving him the winning shot. It's the Thunder. You shouldn't lose to the Thunder. That said... I don't really have a problem with like a December 8th game while seasonal affective disorder outside is like gripping you and it's cold and it's miserable and it's part of a, a stretch where the team is actually kind of playing pretty well and getting itself on track. I would much rather a game where they lose in that heartbreaking, close, intense fashion where I'm having fun and I'm standing up on my feet watching a basketball game in December that has me very excited and is making me feel something. I would much prefer that to like a cruise control win over an embarrassing team or, you know, obviously a blowout loss. You don't want that either. But as far as like, would I take a close, uh, like heartbreaking loss versus a easy, uh, sleepy win, which it kind of felt like it was going to be through the first half. 
I was not very entertained by the first half as well as the Raptors played. I was not terribly enthralled. The second half comes around and there's drama. There's uh, calamity going on for the team. And yes, they ended up losing it, but we saw some nice stretches from the team late in this one that I think are enough to kind of make you feel all right and make it so you can sleep all right. And I don't know about you, but I felt something and had a good time watching this game. And uh, that's really all that matters to me this season, man. I, I, I've totally been in full Hakuna Matata mode all season long. That will continue. Um, obviously, you want to see the team healthy. And, and I don't think you can draw really many conclusions until they are. You know, 11 and 14 is not awesome, but the Eastern Conference is not at all stratifying in any way. It's still pretty clustered. You know, there's still a lot of games at home here for the Raptors as well as they continue this very home-heavy stretch of the schedule. I think there's plenty of opportunity for wins. You know, they play the Knicks on Friday. The Knicks aren't any great shakes. They play the Kings on Monday. Also not great shakes. They got a chance to bounce back from this one. And ultimately, this was a fun and silly and dumb game. And what is watching sports if not looking for fun, silly, and dumb? With that, I will wrap up today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to the show. Congrats to Justin Champagne on his first due to the game win. Hopefully, he gets more chances for game winners in his NBA career. At the very least, give him like a, a late look in a G League game, Patrick Matumbo, just to let him feel that feeling once again. Um, by the way, shout out to Scotty Barnes for his incredible reaction in slow motion when it looked like they had won the game. Very sad it did not all the way go through. Either way. That's going to do it. We'll be back again tomorrow. Once again, as I mentioned, with Kayla Gray from TSN, the Sports uh, Center anchor, the shift host, and of course, sideline reporter for your Raptors on TSN broadcasts. We had a great chat. That's going to be on tomorrow's show. That's kind of an evergreen chat. It'll probably go up in the middle of the afternoon, so just keep an eye out for that. I'm very excited for you to hear it. And then on Friday, Tony East is going to come on the podcast. It's silly season, baby. We are one week away as we speak right now from when trades can start really happening as you know contracts signed in the offseason are movable and Tony East, a man who hates fake trades as much as I do, is coming on the show to talk about fake trades because that's what you do when you're a content person. We're going to talk about Pacers guys and how they might fit with the Raptors. We're going to try to pry Demonis Sabonis and Miles Turner away. That should be fun on Friday, so please tune in for that. Till then, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will talk to you again on Thursday. Uh, in the meantime, go make your second listen of today, Locked on Bets, as Lee Sterling and your boy Q are helping you get through the betting scene, put your money down on the teams and uh, bets that should be winning you money. They are winning everybody money. They, they have a very good hit rate. You should go listen to Locked on Bets promptly. Go do it stat. They're fantastic, and I uh, highly recommend it. Anyway, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll talk to you Thursday. Bye-bye.